How's it going, you guys? So in this video, I wanted to talk about uh, meiosis and kind of compare it a little bit to mitosis and then talk about some things that are unique to meiosis. Uh, we're not going to go through every single step of meiosis, uh, all of meiosis 1 with prophase 1, uh, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, telophase 1. We're not going to go through all of those steps. Um, this is more of an overview video. And uh, we're, gonna, we're also going to talk about uh, crossing over in this video as well as independent assortment. Um, so those are just some concepts that I wanted to discuss. But first things first, I wanted to compare uh, mitotic cell division with mitosis versus meiotic cell division with meiosis. So if we look at a cell that undergoes uh, mitotic cell division, we start off with a diploid cell, and a diploid has two sets of chromosomes, all of them paired up with their homologous pairs, as we talked about. So here's a diploid cell. By the end of mitosis, or mitotic cell division, we will have two identical diploid cells, daughter cells. Now, if we compare that to meiosis, or meiotic cell division, we start off the same way. We have a diploid cell, but after meiosis one, we now have haploid cells, and after a second round of division uh, in meiosis two, we have four haploid cells. Now, you might be confused because the numbers don't really seem to add up here, um, but it does make sense once we consider the fact that you could have replicated chromosomes that have two chromatids, or unreplicated chromosomes that have one chromatid. They're both still considered chromat uh, chromosomes. So let's say we start off the same way. And as you know, uh, humans have 46 chromosomes. Let's just say that this particular organism has only two chromosomes. So we're gonna say for mitotic cell division, we start off with two chromosomes like this. For meiotic cell division, we also start off with two chromosomes, but I'm gonna draw them right next to each other like this. So we start off the same way. We both start off diploid. Then after um, the chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate and they're ripped apart, we have two unreplicated chromosomes in the daughter cells. So we have two replicated chromosomes here, two unreplicated chromosomes here because those chromatids split off. Um, so because of that, since we have two chromosomes here, two chromosomes here, both of these are diploid, and both of these are diploid. So we start off diploid, we end diploid. Now, as for meiotic cell division, we're starting off diploid with our two chromosomes. The first division is we are going to separate the uh, homologous pairs of chromosomes, uh, chromosomes that have the same general genes, one you get from your dad, one you get from your mom. We, as humans, have 23 homologous pairs, so we are going to separate out those pairs. And they're still going to be X-shaped, they're still going to be replicated with two chromatids, but now we have two chromosomes. Here in each one of these cells we have one chromosome, so we are now haploid. We have half the number of chromosomes. And then after that, these uh, replicated chromosomes split again, and we're left with unreplicated chromosomes in each of the um, final cells. So we end with four haploid cells here, and again we have one unreplicated chromosome versus one replicated chromosomes, uh, chromosome. Both of these are haploid. So by the end of mitosis, we have two genetically identical daughter cells. By the end of meiosis, our uh, resulting cells are haploid and they're genetically different. And I'll explain how or why these are genetically distinct uh, daughter cells. Or I should say, meiosis is used to produce gametes, or sex cells, like sperm and egg cells. Whereas mitosis is used for everything else, all other cells of the body. So we call those somatic cells. Cells of the body. So we, as a quick recap, mitosis, start diploid, end diploid, they're identical and therefore somatic cells, uh, cells of the body. For meiosis, we start diploid, we end haploid with four cells as opposed to two, and each one of these cells are genetically uh, distinct. They're genetically unique. So uh, let's get further into meiosis. 
And one thing that I want to talk about with meiosis are these things called tetrads. So in meiosis one, the first uh, round of division, in meiosis one, we have a prophase one, a metaphase one, an anaphase one. And so in prophase one, it's exactly the same as uh, prophase and mitosis. The only difference is the chromosomes condense into their replicated chromosome state, right? And then they take it one step further and pair up with their homologous pairs. And again, homologous pairs of chromosomes are chromosomes with the same general genes on them. So if this one has the gene for eye color, this one also has a gene for eye color. If this one has a gene for foot size, this one also has a gene for foot size. So they're going to pair up with their homologous pairs and they're going to form what is called a tetrad. We call it tetrads because tetra is a prefix meaning four. So if you think about like a, a tetrahedron has uh, four uh, points to it, uh, it is a 3D shape. A, uh, a tetrapod, for example, has uh, four feet, so pod is foot. So tetrapods are things like uh, dogs that have four feet, uh, cats that have four feet. So we have tetra meaning four. Here we have four chromatids. So four chromatids, each of them containing a DNA molecule. So four chromatids, two total chromosomes, and they're homologous chromosomes that have paired up. So this all occurs during prophase one. Uh, we have tetrads that form through the process of uh, what's called synapsis, when two homologous chromosomes, homologous pairs, fuse together to form a tetrad. So tetrad formation is synapsis. And one other cool thing can happen here. When we form a tetrad through synapsis, what could also happen is uh, if you see this part of the paternal chromosome, uh, the blue chromosome, and then this part of the maternal chromosome from the mom, what could happen is we might see these chunks of chromosomes swap. So we could end up seeing something like this, where we have the maternal chromosome ends up swapping out piece of its chromosome for one of the uh, piece of the paternal chromosome and the paternal chromosome could end up getting a piece of the maternal chromosome so they can swap chunks of their chromosomes this process right here I'll point to that point to that that process is called crossing over where they swap chunks of their DNA, swap chunks of their chromosomes. Uh, we could also call this genetic recombination. Genetic recombination. And again, this all happens during prophase one. Prophase one is debatably the most important step that you need to remember of meiosis. Uh, after that, if you know mitosis, you could just follow it logically uh, we're just using tetrads as opposed to replicated chromosomes for, pro, uh, for um, meiosis one. So this crossing over can occur. And also the last thing before we move on from this picture that I want to mention, and this will become uh, important later on when we talk about uh, linked genes and uh, recombination frequency and that kind of stuff. The inner chromatids are the only ones that can undergo crossing over. So these outer chromatids will stay uh, the same. They're not going to uh, gain part of the um, homologous pairs chromosome. So these will stay fully either maternal or paternal, and these inner chromatids could do some crossing over. We could also see crossing over up top here as well. So this all happens during prophase one. It's very important that you know uh, the terms tetrad, synapsis, and crossing over or genetic recombination. So moving on from this process, I want to zoom back out and talk about how crossing over can affect the cell long term or can affect the uh, resulting haploid uh, daughter cells or gametes. So we have our tetrad, right? We start off with our tetrad, pairs of homologous chromosomes stuck together. As you can see, I already drew in some of that uh, genetic recombination, some of that crossing over. They're going to separate out in meiosis one. So 
stuff with meiosis, one. They're going to separate out, and what we're going to see is this uh, paternal chromosome has a piece of the maternal chromosome on the inner chromatid, and this maternal chromosome has a piece of the paternal chromosome on its inner chromatid. So that all happens during meiosis one, it's separated out, um, and then it separates again because these uh, replicated chromosomes split once more into their unreplicated chromosome state. So, and that happens during meiosis two. And so what you see here, if you look at the results, we have a chromosome that was entirely paternal from the dad. We have a chromosome that's mostly paternal with a little bit of maternal chromosome. We have a chromosome that's mostly maternal with a piece of paternal chromosome. And then we have a fully maternal chromosome. And these are all in the gametes. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a flagellum, a tail, to show that these are sperm. If it's a male, if it's a female, it's eggs. And also a quick tangent uh, for males. Uh, males start um, undergoing uh, meiosis in their uh, sex organs, their testes. Uh, after puberty, uh, whereas females, uh, their meiosis occurs before birth, so they have all the eggs they will ever have at the beginning um, of their life, uh, right after they're born. Uh, they're born with all the eggs they will ever have, but they start maturing one by one once they hit um, puberty. But in this situation, we have four genetically distinct haploid cells. Haploid gametes. Sex cells. So that's how crossing over can lead to genetic variation uh, in the gametes and in the resulting uh, offspring. Now, one other concept that I want to discuss, well actually there's one concept that I missed, sorry. Uh, so there's one concept before I discuss, discuss the last concept, and that is what's called non-disjunction. So what could happen during meiosis is uh, non-disjunction where uh, these chromosomes, let's say these tetrads, want to split, right? That in the ideal world, they will split, but on occasion, they don't um, dissociate properly. They don't split. So we could have our tetrad like this in our starting diploid cell, but if we have non-disjunction in meiosis one, we could get both of those chromosomes in one cell and none of those chromosomes in the other cell. And then it goes through meiosis two, and we can have two chromosomes here in one of the gametes, two chromosomes in one of the gametes, and then none of those chromosomes for this particular pair in these gametes. So these two have one too many chromosomes, and these two have one too few chromosomes. So that is non-disjunction, I'll put that over here non-disjunction. And non-disjunction is uh, the cause of things like um, uh, Down syndrome, for example. So Down syndrome has one too many chromosomes uh, at the 21st pair. Typically non-disjunction, if you get uh, one too many chromosomes um, in one of your autosomal chromosomes, anything besides your sex chromosomes, Chances are uh, it's going to be severe enough where you're not going to survive development. You're not going to survive uh, past birth. But uh, something for uh, the 20, something about the 21st chromosome, um, it is a little less severe, perhaps because it's smaller and it has fewer genes on it than some of the others. Uh, but having an extra 21st chromosome does not mean that you're going to uh, die during development. Um, so. Because of that, people are born with an extra 21st chrom chromosome, but it leads to complications during development that could cause Down syndrome. Um, typically with your sex chromosomes, um, if you have an extra sex chromosome or too few, uh, that's typically not lethal, um, but it will lead to other complications as well. So Turner syndrome is an example of a uh, situation where you have one too few sex chromosomes. You only have one X. So, uh, this is non-disjunction in meiosis one. You could also have non-disjunction in meiosis two. So let's restart and imagine that the tetrad splits appropriately. So we have the tetrad like this. So we have two replicated chromosomes, one in each cell. 
and then these intermediate cells split again, except let's say this one splits properly. So this one, these two gametes have the normal number of chromosomes, but these two gametes have one more, or, or this particular gamete takes both of them, so these don't split like they're supposed to, so both go one way. This gamete has one too many chromosomes, and this gamete has one too few chromosomes. Um, now, I'm only doing this with one chromosome. Again, humans have 46. So this would be like 23, 23, and then typically one of those chromosomes might not split properly. So we could end up seeing 24 here, and this could be 22. Um, so non-disjunction can happen in meiosis one or meiosis two. Either way, we're gonna have uh, too many chromosomes in some gametes and too few chromosomes in another. So that is non-disjunction. So now that we've, we're done talking about crossing over and non-disjunction, the last concept that I wanna mention is this concept of independent assortment. So independent assortment is uh, the concept that we have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the paternal chromosomes, all 23 paternal chromosomes have to separate one way and all 23 maternal chromosomes have to separate the other way. So you could have any combination of this. So let me, I'll represent this with two chromosomes. We have a homologous pair, uh, one from the dad, one from the mom. And here we have another homologous pair, one from the dad, one from the mom, just slightly smaller so we can differentiate. So if they were to align like this, if these tetrads were to align like this in meiosis one, uh, what would happen is when they split, we'd have two paternal chromosomes on, in one cell and two maternal chromosomes in the other cell. And then they split again and we see something like this, where these two are fully paternal and these two are fully maternal. Now for the sake, uh, to make it less con confusing, uh, like it, make it less, uh, busy up on this board, I excluded a crossing over. We know that crossing over does occur here, uh, but I'm going to exclude that for now for the sake of uh, better understanding this concept. So if we don't, uh, if we assume that no crossing over happens, this is one possibility where we have this combination or this combination of chromosomes. But it is equally as likely that these uh, that this, the, let's say these last two chromosomes, flip. So instead, the tetrad aligns such that the paternal chromosome is on the right and the maternal chromosome is on the left. So now you can see uh, the, they will assort slightly differently. So now we could have the maternal chromosome, the small one, here, and the paternal chromosome here. And then when they separate out, we'll have one paternal chromosome and one maternal in each of these gametes. And on this side, we'll have one maternal, and the small one will be paternal. So in that situation, um, those are our possible outcomes and they're equally as likely, right? So you could have, let's say we had some organism with uh, say three sets of chromosomes, three homologous pairs. You could have the first pair, let's say the first chromosome from the dad, so we'll say one paternal, that could pair up with uh, the second chromosome that's from the dad, or that could separate with the second chromosome that's from the mom. Same thing, we could have the first chromosome from the mom separate with the second chromosome from the dad, or second chromosome from the mom. And if we consider this a step further, if this is a three chromosome uh, organism, or three uh, homologous pair organism, this second chromosome, paternal, could separate out with the third paternal chromosome or the third maternal chromosome. 
and so on and so forth. So we can already see that there are a couple different ways that we could get uh, genetically different gametes if we don't even consider crossing over. So three maternal, three paternal, three maternal, and so on and so forth. But if this is a three homologous pair organism, we say it's diploid, raised to the third, and what we end up seeing is eight possible genetically different gametes, sex cells. Now, this isn't the case for humans. Humans have 46 chromosomes, right? So we don't, or uh, 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. We don't have three pairs of chromosomes here. So for humans, we would say, this would take forever, by the way, but we would say we're diploid with 23 pairs of chromosomes, and that equates to something above, so something uh, greater than eight million different options. So not even considering, cross, uh, considering crossing over, we could get uh, upwards of eight million different possible uh, combinations of our chromosomes in our sex cells, in our gametes. And that's due to this concept of independent assortment. Uh, so certain chromosomes don't have to assort with certain other chromosomes. They're independent, so we can get uh, the paternal chromosome going here, maternal going this way. We could have two paternals on this side, two maternals on this side, or we could flip it. You know, we could have one paternal and one maternal on this side, and one uh, maternal and one paternal on this side. So all in all, uh, between independent assortment between and crossing over, and uh, the uh, subsequent uh, fertilization of the gametes with sperm and egg cells, we get a lot of genetic variation within a population. And so all of this genetic variation will lead to um, increased fitness, which we'll talk about perhaps down the road. Um, so more variation equals more fitness, and therefore the uh, species is more likely to survive. So hopefully that was helpful in terms of the difference between meiosis and mitosis, uh, the concepts of crossing over, uh, independent assortment, and non-disjunction. Uh, and if you have any questions, just let me know.